This episode of the Wholesale Hackers Live Q&A is brought to you by DealBell.io. Get the unfair advantage you never knew existed. DealBell gives you all the tools you need, including their innovative skip stack technology, so you can effortlessly identify the hottest off-market properties and win more deals faster. For more information and a free 14-day trial, go to www.dealbell.io. Deal Bell. Win the deal and ring the bell. What's up? What's up, everybody? Hey, welcome to another episode of Real Estate Investing Advice with myself, Brent Marino, and of course, the one and only Jory Austin. For those of you that are new that are joining us, uh, be sure to spread some love, share this video with everyone, let everybody know that we're doing this live on Wednesdays. Uh, for those of you who are new, this is your chance to answer all of your questions, get all your questions answered. This is a free hour that Jory and I give every single week, or at least most weeks. Not, not every week we're able to make it. But most weeks we're here live answering your questions, so we really appreciate you guys uh, participating. So without without you know, without anything without any further ado, here is Mr. Jory Austin. What's up, brother? What's up? What's up, man? Can you hear me? You no, know, just just living the dream. Oh yeah, I got you. I swear, like every time you pop on, you're in a different location. Well, I mean, I'm always at my um, <laughs> my farm. But it's still in construction, so who knows what part of the farm would be at, you know? So, gotcha, gotcha. right now, I'm on the porch. <clears throat> you can see over there. I don't know if you can see over there, but uh, there's part of my container home right there. Oh, they got it up. It is up. It's dropped. It's welded to the foundation. I'm not in it yet, but uh, hopefully within a week, I'll be in there. In a week, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, there's, there's finishing work getting done. So we actually dropped it. It dropped on uh, Wednesday as far as, like, the, you know, Ashley brought it up here with a crane. A crane had to pick it up, put it on the foundation. It's two forty 40-foot containers. So that was a big, big ordeal. Um, you know, it was about six, seven-hour <laughs> ordeal moving two containers into that uh, that foundation, you know. And then when they're actually dropped, then they can actually go and start, you know, welding, welding them together, welding to the foundation, you know, doing the finishing work flooring, cabinets, um, electrical, you know, all the stuff that you're going to do when it's actually here on the foundation. So, um, is, so what about that, the structure behind you? Is that going to be, is it, you're going to keep that stay there? When, I thought you bought land. Did it come with that? Yeah. This house behind, this is actually like a three, this is, this is a, uh, two bedroom house behind us. So we are going to fix this up. So we'll have two bedrooms. One of the, the first was going to be like a little office that studio where i'll be doing content and stuff at and then you know farm it'll have to be like a farmhouse where a lot of farm stuff in here then this middle room right behind me um you know would be an extra bedroom so yeah gotcha. that's the next project we're moving towards this Good deal. i was actually just out at the uh our short-term rental that we picked up we had to have a city come by and do an inspection um, we're all good gotta have a gate that closes behind itself for the pool but other than that uh, we're we passed with flying colors but we got ivan on he said what's up fellas been too long good to be here Hi, man what's up <clears throat> so guys we have you know basically 50 minutes here now to where we can answer all of your questions see we got a good bit of people on so i want to we need some questions otherwise this is me and george sitting here talking about our week I don't know how exciting that could possibly be, but I guess some people dig it. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> my, my week's been all over. I've been in tents, Airbnbs, <laughs> you know, watching cranes, the containers over. You know, I had to build a build an extra road just to get my container up here. It's been eventful. You know? <laughs> Let's talk about the markets, though, right? The market, the markets have been a little crazy. I mean, you can watch the markets. That's like a that's like a action film right now isn't it yeah markets target apparently just took a huge dump well walmart yesterday target today yeah yeah you know, walmart took the biggest dump since 87 and target followed them up by beating the record today so i'm know. pretty sure walmart and target can will be okay yeah oh yeah yeah, yeah. i mean those are you know 
those are buys. I mean, I'm not saying buy now. You know, I, I have zero stock, so don't don't take any stock stock advice from me. You know, but if there were stocks to buy, I mean, Target and Walmart, you know, will be. Um, you know, but it's inflation. Inflation inflation killed their numbers. Um, you know, Target Target said their, I think their income was down 25. percent You know, and it was mostly because of the rising costs. Right, the, the costs are up. So. You know, inflation is a real thing. It's not transitory. It's not here and gone tomorrow. I mean, inflation's here. You know, we're going to have inflation for a little while. So it's going to affect prices. Cece and I went up to Hattiesburg yesterday. She had to end up uh, letting an assistant go and then interviewed another assistant. And I went and checked in on my flip up there. Uh, it's coming along. It's been a long time going with that one. Had to run off a contractor who wasn't, who said he was doing work and kind of, you know, sending me. L- a little bit of tidbits of photos and videos here and there, but next thing I know, he's saying he cut his almost cut his leg off and he couldn't work for two weeks. And come to find out, he had done that like back in January and was just over it. couldn't Couldn't finish the job, so he left me with about an additional twenty thousand dollars in work. <laughs> but um, we're all good on that one. So we bought it. We bought that house for ninety six five. I've actually already pre sold it, so I'm going to start. I know the market's cooling off, so I don't know if I'll be able to do this with everything, but if we're going to pick up a flip, we'll just go ahead and pre-sell it. I'm like, hey, you know, get approved, get everything. Like, we'll be able to pick out your colors, your paint, uh, for your uh, flooring and all that stuff. But so we sold this one. We picked up 965. We'll have about 40 in it. Um, and we sold it for 235 already. So I feel pretty good about that. Should be closing in the next two or three weeks. That's good. I, was, I mean, that brings me to something I was gonna say. I mean, uh, with the market and with the uh, uncertainty in the market, we are starting to see some stuff happen in the mortgage market here. You know, I, I got my first. Uh, we had a refinance going on, and I got not refinance that I was doing, but a, a borrower of ours was refinancing us out. And uh, he sent me the email yesterday from the lender that, um, you know, the email basically said due to economic economic you know uncertainty that um, this is one of the loans that has been caught. <laughs> in the crossfire and it won't be able to be done you know oh, that won't be able to be done so you know that's one of the first things that we have um so ivan's got a good question my favorite question is the answer about skip tracing interesting skip tracing how is deal bell different or better than others so i will say this data is inherently flawed you're not going to have one single system that's going to give you a hundred percent of everybody's contact information a hundred percent of the time. It's just not going to happen. Um, however, what I did was instead of going with the industry standard, uh, and going with IDI, which is just about who everybody uses as their back end for their, uh, skip tracing provider. Mm-hmm. Um, instead of going with them, I interviewed probably about 20 different, I tested about 20 different platforms, went with the one I felt like had the best results after testing. Basically what we did was we created a spreadsheet of 150, individuals with addresses and we already had their correct information. So we skip trace those and we, we chose what I felt like was the best. Um, not only in that, because they gave us a good, they gave us a good price as long as we're buying uh, enough data. But what makes our data different is that we don't, there's no limitations. It's instant. It's, it's, it's never going to be charged for a duplicate. <laughs> and you can deep dive, you can pull a comprehensive report, which is by far the most powerful thing uh, you can pull for a homeowner. Uh, unless you just have direct access to TLO, you're not going to get much more information. We actually are looking at ways of implementing some of the TLO features, like being able to run license plates uh, and VIN numbers and stuff like that. So you can pull up the owner's information. Maybe there's an old car in the driveway and it's got a, you can check the license plate and maybe find their information that way. Uh, there's some people that have kind of requested that feature. So we're looking into, into adding that because I know on the back end we can do it. But to answer your question is we sell data at cost. So the more users we onboard, the more people who are spending money inside of our system and skip tracing, cause I, I don't make any money on the data. Uh, where we make our money is, is on the monthly membership. And as we continue to grow and add more users, we can continue to build the platform out and develop it into a, you know, a CRM, a texting capabilities and, and phone capabilities and follow-ups and all that stuff. So there, there's a lot of cool features we're wanting to add, but we're trying to add all that stuff in, you know, at a minimum cost, uh, and we need more users to do that. But right now, I mean, for a basic monthly membership at forty-seven dollars, you can get your records at ten cents a record, and you're going to. There's unlimited amounts of numbers. So if it's 
you know, there might be 18 numbers with one property, which is not necessarily good or a bad thing. It just gives you more options uh, than most providers. And if you can't get a hold of them with the numbers that are provided, pull a comprehensive report. I always tell everybody like the gold is, is where the people are not getting contacted, right? That return mail or those big lists that you pull that you just, you breeze through because you got a bad wrong number or disconnected number and you don't go back and look into it. Take those bad wrong numbers and no contacts and take those return mailers, pull a comprehensive report. And I guarantee you that you will find somebody that knows something about that property that can put you in contact with the owner. I'm yet to have one where if I could pull a comprehensive report that I wasn't able to get in touch with somebody who could either, at least put me in touch with the owner of the property. So that's where we're different. If you sign up for the annual membership, uh, you get the, you get eight cents a record, which is, um, it's stupid cheap. I mean, and it's credit level data. So it's some of the best data you can possibly buy. Um, but yeah, that's, that's really what makes us different. And we include list stacking inside of the program as well. So I know like most list stacking software start off around $99 a month, at least the first one that I ever used did. And that's all it did. Uh, whereas $47 a month, you get that included and it, it does it auto magically. So yeah, check it out. Dealbell.io. You can sign up for a 14 day free trial. All you got to do is put your card information in, uh, top off your account, and you're good to go. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone should just try to trial, run some comprehensive reports and see what it does. You know? I mean, I know people ask us the question, but the comprehensive reports are just so groundbreaking and so useful to your business that, you know, you got to just try it out for yourself and see what happens. <clears throat> yeah. Ryan says, thanks for the great content, guys. I'm on my way to wash a house next to the wharf. He, he actually uh, just power washed one of our houses. Did a good job. Um, he said, same launch question control. for launch control. So Jory doesn't use launch control, but I do. Um, it's, you know, six in one hand, a half dozen in the other. If you know that old, old phrase, right? It's really not a huge ton of difference. They're both built off of Twilio. Uh, they both have some similar capabilities. I like launch just because I have a personal relationship with the owner and we've been friends for a long time. We were in a mastermind together. Um, and he gave me access to the platform and I started using it and I really liked it before that I was on lead Sherpa, but then lead Sherpa started having issues with deliverability, um, which I think everyone had issues with at some point in time. However, they were pretty quick to solve a lot of those and they're just, they're the way they do things is just a little bit different, but not that much different than any other texting platform. Uh, but I'm a huge fan. I've, I've gotten a lot of deals off of text over the last couple of years and Launch has been easy and simple to use on my end. Jory uses Batch. I use Batch. And I think the main, I mean, you said some of the main key points to why we use what we use, right? The first one is, I mean, I use Batch because, you know, I uh, was close to the owners of Batch, you know, Jesse and Ivan uh, and Annie, you know, they're uh, good friends. And so, you know, they kind of showed me the whole ropes of what Batch was doing and uh, working me. And I haven't had any issues with it, right? I mean, if I had issues with it, then I would have switched <laughs> to somewhere else, but it's, it's worked for me. There hasn't been issues. I mean, there's been the, you know, all these, all these, these uh, platforms have, have bugs. They have, you know, they have issues when they're adding stuff on. Nothing's, you know, 100% uh, bug free, right? But it's like, what are you comfortable with? What are you used to? Like, especially when you have a team, you know, what have you trained your team to use? <laughs> and switching that kind of stuff becomes difficult, you know? So I don't think there's many differences between launch control or batch. I mean, they do different things. Batch is probably more encompassing of what it offers, but. At the end of the day, find something that you know how to use that you're comfortable with and stick to it. Yeah. And this is the thing too. I don't want to get carried away with talking about all these different products and services and everything else. At the end of the day, get, going and getting a deal, especially locally in your market, you don't need, you don't need all this software. You don't need all these big lists. You don't need any of this stuff. Just keep your, keep your, uh, your ear to the ground, go knock on some foreclosures, call some foreclosures. You know, you don't have to go and spread yourself out. I know it's a lot easier to just sit on your computer and sit there and send text messages, but that's more of a, a numbers approach. And it's very easy to get frustrated because you're like, I'm, I just, I've texted 5,000 people and I, I haven't gotten a deal. Um, whereas if you go and have conversations with people at their house by knocking on their door and they're a foreclosure or whatever the case may be, uh, chances are you'll have a lot more, uh, you'll have a lot better response. Yeah, we're, we're really just focusing on we're really just focusing on getting one or two deals a month. I mean, that's what most people are that are coming to us are you know they're struggling 
they either get their first deal or struggling to have some consistency getting one or two deals a month and are even growing that if you're trying to grow that then that's a whole different conversation we could talk about scaling all day long uh scaling only really becomes an issue whenever you have people involved uh the more people you have involved the more the more processes and systems you have to put in place and the better manager you have to be um which turns out i ha haven't been a fantastic manager I just, i've been really good about putting systems and processes in place but the people have to follow those systems and processes yeah, I'm not. I'm not the person who talks about scale. You know, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not scaled right now. I'm not looking to scale. I'm looking to have a comfortable, you know, uh, business that does what I needed to do. That gives me freedom, you know, to do what I want to do with my husband, with my wife, with my, you know, with my kids, with my family, with my friends. You know, um, it makes you some say big, your husband. Some some money. You almost say husband. I don't know why. Yeah, I'm thinking. I'm looking at my wife. That's why. <laughs> you know, but uh, you know, there's no, there's no scale in my company. We're very, very small. You know, we like it that way. So, but what I would say is, you know, use the platform that you're using that makes sense for you. You know, like use it yourself. Um, I think a lot of times people want to scale. They want to get a platform. They don't even know how to use themselves, right? And then that becomes an issue. You know, go out there, try a few platforms, find out what works best for you, right? But don't get stuck with paralysis and analysis of what CRM or what tax tax platform or what. You know, well, website. I mean, I had somebody I talked to the other day talking about, you know, they were asking about multiple LLCs. Like, do you have one LLC yet? No, I don't know if I should get a Wyoming holding LLC and this should be, I mean, I don't even, I don't even know what that stuff, what is a Wyoming holding LLC, right? Just get an LLC, right? Start doing business, right? Open up a bank People account. are worried about, you know, setting up, they're, they're worried about setting up their, their business in a certain way of a tax structure when you haven't even had a taxable event inside of the business or even have a exactly. business yet, right? Uh, let's worry about saving money on taxes when it's really an issue. Yeah, just set the LLC up, you know, set up one. Or if you do, a, you know, if you, and I told you, if you, if you are doing multiple types of business, like me, we have different, you know, LLCs for different types of business, right? We have our wholesaling, which is an active business. We have our notes, we have our rentals, right? Do that and just set up one of each one. But don't sit around, you know, worried about, you know, does it need to be in Wyoming or Delaware or this or that? And then, you know, how do I structure it? Or do I need to have a land trust? Just open up an LLC, open up a bank account, and start doing business. You know, I mean, too many times people get so caught up on these high level, you know, things that actually don't save you taxes unless you're making a certain amount of money per year, which you're not even making right. yet. You know, <laughs> uh, I haven't asked Batch Dialer. I don't think it's the dialer, is it that you're using? You're using Batch Leads to text? I use Batch Leads, yeah. So that's, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Batch, batch has a suite of different products. They have the Batch Dialer, they have their, uh, you know, list list pulling list stacking um uh program and they have the actual uh texting you know platform so i use batch leads which gives me batch leads and I have the texting i don't do i don't do cold calling so we don't have batch now and you're the goat jory no jacob's the goat <laughs> <laughs> jacob is actually just I'm, jacob is actually the greatest running back ever coached the football <laughs> and him him and another football player of mine sold their first deal last week. So, you know, Jacob's the goat. Congrats, Jacob. Awesome, man. That's, that's, that's exciting. Uh, I keep seeing all these ads for subject to, and they make it seem so simple. What are the things on a sub two that can mess you up? What do we need need to be weary of? Let's go. On. This this is a long. This is a, a deep con, but we get into. Um, first of all, all these ads at. <laughs> There's sub two ads nowadays, or, or just comments. But um, I mean, sub two, sub two can be tricky if you don't know what you're doing. And I think we talked about this before, you know, many, many times. I do sub two, Brent do sub two. I'm not saying you can't do sub two, right? If you understand sub two, you would definitely do sub two. If you're a new investor or not, right? But when you're doing sub two, the small version is this: you are responsible for paying that seller's mortgage, regardless of if the person you sell the house to rent the house who pays you or not right so regardless of if they call that note due if you have the money or not you're responsible to pay that note right your main goal is to make sure that that seller who you bought the house for sub two that they aren't damaged that they aren't bothered that they're fine and smooth they're not having to worry about you know you making payments right so that's the main thing to be worried about so if you get into sub two and you don't have the money to cover the mortgage payment in case your you know your tenant can't pay you then that's an issue if you get in sub two and they call the note Right, the mortgage company says, "Hey, this note's due. You bought a sub two, and you can't pay off that note, or find or find the means to pay off that note. That can become an issue, right? So, I mean, those to me are the are the two uh, 
the two things you need to worry out, you know, uh, worry about, right? If you if you can cover those two things, then sub two is fine. It's perfectly fine, Ooh. and it's a great strategy. Yeah. It's an amazing strategy. Yeah, it's a fantastic strategy. Um, matter of fact, we've got. One, two, we got two of those right now. So, I mean, I think we've bought six homes subject to the last year, you know. So, again, it's a great strategy. It's a way to get into a property right now with a little more down and owner financing with a low interest rate. I mean, you know, if like we said last week, if you start doing some sub two on these deals that were uh, were bought by homeowners, you know, last year and beginning of this year, you're going to find some amazing interest rates, you know. So, it's a way to get into a property at a low rate usually and a little money down so for example we bought one where the arv was probably like 180 i think the unpaid balance is probably 120 we get into it for fifteen thousand dollars you know so that's what sub two allows you to do it allows you to get into a property with a, lo a low amount of uh, money down yep i mean we were in a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar property now granted it needs a lot of work uh to get to that 350 but we're in a three hundred fifty thousand dollar property for we control it and own it for less than 15 grand out of pocket. I mean, it's kind of hard to beat. And she only owed like 78 or 79. So we're, we're good. Like no matter what happens, we're fine. I could literally sell the house as it sits right now, probably for 200. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how you evaluate them, right? You're just, you're just trying to evaluate what your risk is, you know, um, you know, you don't want to be upside down in the sub two, you know, a sub two deal. You want to make sure that you, you know, with your exit strategy, some kind of, you know, cash flow strategy, either as a wrap or as a rental. You want to make sure you can cash flow so you can pay, you know, you can pay that that underlying mortgage all the time. Um, if you're going to flip it, just make sure that your your unpaid balance, whatever rehab and closing costs you have, is underneath, you know, where you're trying to flip it at. So, you know. <clears throat> uh, Ivan says he was stuck in analysis paralysis for about two months. About two months ago, got fed up, just started taking action. Now they're negotiating some pretty large deals. Always good to hear. Congrats. That's the main thing, man. Like, like just get out there and do the work. And it's not going to happen right away, right? Because even when you're doing the work, if you're new, it's going to take time. I mean, the biggest issue I see with, you know, with new investors is they expect something right away. And it's like, you know, it took me years <laughs> to get where I am today, but it takes a long time to even get your first deal, you know. But if you're sitting around being, you know, paralyzed by the analysis and you haven't started the work yet you're just adding more time to what's going to already be a long process so you know like brent said there's easy ways to get deals and easy ways to find buyers I, i'm from the camp where you go find a buyer first i mean people are mixed on this um some people are like no i'm gonna go find it you know it's like the listing agent buyer's agent realtor thing right i was a buyer's agent in real estate and i always figured out that hey if you find the buyer you know what that buyer wants it's easier to find a deal for that buyer right so I'm of the camp, if you're starting off, go out there and find out what buyers are looking for, right? Go out to your local meetups, go onto these Facebook books, right? Watch our podcast every week where we talk about that we're looking for deals, right? Find out a buyer's profile, right? a buyer box, and then go find a deal that makes sense for that buyer. Um, you know, yeah. that's what I see as the easiest. You know, some people think it's easier to find find sellers, but I am 100% behind the idea that you go find a buyer, you know, see what the buyer wants, then go find them a deal. Right. Well, then you can focus your efforts in your marketing, right? So if he says, I want something in this zip code, that's a three, two brick on a slab. Well, then now I know, now I know, and he said, I'll pay, you know, upwards of $150,000 to $250,000. If it's, you know, doesn't need any work. Um, now I know what I'm going to looking for. And I know where I, where I got to be at yep. versus taking the, the guessing game and going, well, maybe it's a deal. Maybe it's not a deal. I mean, I've seen five thousand dollar houses that aren't deals. Oh yeah, I mean, we just turned down one. You know, the, the seller won eight grand. You know, we're just like, no, there's no, <laughs> I can't pay eight grand. This would be, be an eight grand headache. <laughs> um, this is a good question. In terms of wholesaling, now this is not legal advice. We do not give any legal or our financial advice on this show. We just give our state our opinions. So, in terms of wholesaling. What do you do if you can't find a buyer and can't buy the house yourself? Is there an out in the contract? Do you have to put it put in the contract contingent upon finding financing or something along those lines? So you you should give yourself an inspection period in the contract. Uh, and that inspection period will be your time to uh, find a reason to get out. Um, however, if you have a deal and you don't have anyone interested in buying it, which it typically means it's not a deal. 
Uh, so you should yeah. know something within the first five days of, of marketing that property or sending out uh, the, the contract for assignment to buyers. You should know pretty quickly whether or not you know anyone's interested in it or not. Um, like whenever I first got started, I didn't have a huge list of buyers. I had like six that I met at a courthouse for a foreclosure. And I just called them all and they all came in. Well, actually the first one that came and looked at it, I, I staggered the appointments when I should have put up, put everybody there at one time, uh, just as just not knowing what to do. Uh, cause I probably could have made like additional five or $10,000 on that house. Had I known what I was doing, chalk it up to a seminar. Uh, but I still ended up making about 13, I still ended up making $13,000 on my first house, but I just found, I went to the foreclosure auction, met some people that were buying there, shook their hands, introduced myself, got their contact information. When I came across a house that I felt like they would be a good fit, I let everybody know. And I started scheduling time for people to come look at it. Um, what I would advise is once you do that, you should set a time and date for like one or two hours to have everybody come out at one time. Yeah, I mean, and this question is a good question, right? And it's a, it's a question in the whole center where people are like, wait, you mean I can lock the house up and if I can't buy it, <laughs> you know what, I don't go to jail, I'm not going to just buy the house, right? So the key is your contract, right? And it's, it's knowing what a contract is, right? So your contract is valid after, after two things, right? It's fully executed, meaning buy and sell a sign and earnest money deposit, right, is agreed upon. So... The first thing you need to do is make sure you put in your earnest in your uh, contract the lowest amount of earnest deposit possible, right? We always put five hundred dollars, so it's five hundred dollar earnest deposit. Um, I've seen people put ten dollars in there, you know. But understand your earnest deposit, right? If your contract structured the right way, which it should always be, the worst that can happen to you if you can't close is you lose your earnest deposit, right? Now I'm not saying that five hundred bucks or whatever it is, is. I mean that's a lot of money, right? So I'm not saying you don't want to lose it. You know, I've never lost one. Because actually in my contract, we have other outs and contingencies in our contract. So your contract is going to protect you in case you can't buy it. You know, um, my contract, I'm sure Brent's contract, I mean, I can, I can back out the day before closing. And I have a legal way in my contract where I can, you know, I can fight it and win. But we don't do that, right? The, the key is this. When you get a contract, you want to market that contract right away. And then after a week, right, you want to reevaluate and say, okay, where are we at, right? If come, if, you know, if come that following Monday, Tuesday, after you had a few days on the weekend, you have nothing on that contract, then you need to, you need to call that seller up and you need to renegotiate the price or tell them you can't make, you know, you need to back out, right? That's the ethical right. way to do things. You know, you're not going to have any issues calling them after a week. What happens is you wait till four weeks later and two days before close and say, hey, I can't close this deal. That's what gets wholesalers in, 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 in uh, trouble. That's what has the wholesale business being regulated left and right right now. That's why, yeah. you know, the government and NAR and cities are coming out on wholesalers because wholesalers are out there doing bad business. You know, you know, if you have a deal or not, and you know, if you have a deal or not within that first week, you know, yeah. if you don't have a deal, that means the phone's not ringing. Nobody's calling you. Nobody's talking to you. If the people who are talking to you are saying, hey, I can buy it, but I got to be at 80 and you're at like 95. Well, you're starting to get feedback on that deal. You need to go renegotiate. <laughs> And, and right. you know, be a bigger person to go renegotiate that contract, right? Hey, Mr. Seller, you know, after, after you know, doing our walkthroughs, my contract and stuff, you know, we're seeing that the property's really only worth this right now. This is the best I can do, you know? And if they say no, they say no, you back out, right? You've been in Tech for a week, you back out. You know, what I'm hearing lots of times now is people have had contracts locked up for two, three months, <laughs> saying they're going to close. They didn't close. Then after three months, you know, when I call, they're just angry at the world. You know, we have to come in there and do and do a damage control. I mean, look, there's even some big operations that I know of. And I, I don't agree with this practice. I don't do it at all. Uh, however, it's it seems to be working for a lot of people. They'll lock it up under contract if it's you know close or questionable, just to kind of see where they're at. And then you know they go and market it, don't get any bites, and then wait till the last minute to try to renegotiate it down. I'd like that's not the way not the way to do it it's not how you wanted to be treated like if i was selling my house and you told me you were buying it and you're going to pay cash and we're going to close on on my terms and my day don't drag me along for 30 days because you not only are you wasting my time you're putting my, my time in jeopardy like because i'm yeah. getting busy you know preparing to sell getting things situated or moved or whatever um so don't don't be that person and the good the good rule of thumb here is if you had the money would you buy it no doubt about it Right. And so if you had the money, if you can tell yourself, like I'm buy, I would buy this deal 
no ifs, ands, or buts, then it's probably a decent deal uh, as long as you know what you're looking at. Or if you like your if you're like your grandmother, uh, which I did like my grandmother's, both of them, uh, would you use your grandmother's money? Would you invest her money to buy it? <laughs> yeah, and, and I know there's people probably saying, hey, you know, I don't, I don't even have any money. I don't even know how to um, evaluate the deal yet. So you, you, you do lock it up and you test the waters, but you just make sure that, you know, you test the waters quickly. And you yeah, know how to you quickly. know how to change you know how to change if you need to change right away right yeah. and and you communicate you know the worst thing with sellers are you lock a deal up they haven't heard from you for three four weeks and then they call you hey the closing date says it's you know in two days and you're like ah oh, yeah I can't close right now but you haven't talked to them at all in three four weeks you know it just gives away a bad name. What's up, man? Uh, he says if you wrap a sub two and a note gets called. Do you have to sell your wrap note to pay off the bank note, or can you bring in private money to replace the bank note? You don't. Have, you do not have to sell your note, right? So, if your note is called, you just gotta you just gotta satisfy that that note that that, that um, first position note, that first position note, right? It has nothing to do with yep. your note. You know, if if you can't satisfy that first position note, then your note's gonna isn't is in the fault too anyway, right? But no, that right. that note being called just means you need to bring cash or you know private money to satisfy that first position note yeah and i think that's what he was asking or can you bring private money to replace the bank note yeah, yeah you, you can just do gotta, yeah, you just gotta pay off the bank you just make the bank hole and then whatever you have lined up is still good and notes getting called due chances are very slim as long as everything's being paid um on time um but this is also why i don't i don't i don't risk it for the biscuit when it comes to uh doing sub twos with zero equity like I, I love cash flow but it had to be a substantial amount of cash flows it had to be something like a, a short-term rental that can produce you know three four thousand dollars a month and in, in net uh before i would take on something that didn't have any equity just in case i, just, I like to sleep a little bit better at night maybe i miss out a lot of money for it but that's okay there's a lot more to be made elsewhere the, yeah and, and again that's you know if you're new, you definitely don't want to do that. You know, if you're someone who has who has the fund the funding behind you where it's easy to kind of check for that, maybe you do take that risk, right? You know, the risk, the risk yeah. tolerance depends on the person, you know. But um, you know, usually you don't want to do that. I agree. But the note being called should not be stopping you from doing so too, because I've said many times, I've been talking to several banks, <laughs> you know, who know that we bought the house up too, and they have no desire to, to call that note. I mean. Right. They just call me to check on us and say, "Hey, how you guys doing? You know, what's what's the plan? You know, what's the plan? Payments are being made. They're good. You know, um, they don't want to know bad." Yeah. So always remember, the good deal you miss will always sting less than the bad deal you do. Will do. Uh, so with those two covered, can we pay the note no matter what? Who can we go to get the paperwork needed to complete a sub two? Do we need a special purchase and sale contract? So this is uh, I remember my very first sub two, and I had all these questions on about like, do I need a special contract? Do I need this? Do I need that? Uh, this is where a good relationship with an attorney who knows what they're doing, who's familiar with subject twos, who's familiar with working with investors. Um, because actually, I had a conversation with some of our mastermind members the other day. Their attorney was not comfortable handling subject twos. He works with a lot of investors and a lot of wholesalers, but had never done a subject two. And he was saying that he he didn't want to do have any part of it unless you know he created all these files or created all these documents that saying that you know he wasn't going to be responsible if anything went wrong. So they were trying to basically scare them out of the deal. And I was like, look, you guys are fine. You're good. Um, but the easiest thing to remember is like in my contract. Uh, which is inside of the real estate investing advice Facebook group in my contract, I always have a term section that is blank kind of about that's on the first page, just below all the legal descriptions and buyer seller name, all that stuff. And it says terms nine times out of 10 it's, you know, it's cash. But if it's a subject to deal, I literally all I have to do is write in there subject to the existing financing. That's it. And then whatever agreement I have after that. So if it's a, a subject to that I'm going to flip and we're going to split the proceeds on the back end. I just write that. If it's a sliding scale, I've literally wrote like if we sell it for $250,000, they get 10,000. We sell it for over 275. They'll get 15,000 or whatever, right? There's all kinds of ways, but it's, it's writing it in plain English and your attorney can handle the rest. 
Yeah. That's the, that's the easiest way to do it, you know. I, I have two different contracts. I have a, uh, you know, my assignment wholesale contract, and I have, you know, my terms contract, which means either owner financing or subject to. You know, we just created two contracts that we use. But, you know, I see a lot of people get hung up on the purchase agreement, right? You can have your regular wholesale purchase agreement and just do what Brent said, right? Even if you don't have terms, you can put, you know, you, you usually want to have like an other items box, right? If you've ever seen a, a real estate contract that a realtor uses, it'll be like other items, additional items. You can write in there, you know, subject to the existing mortgage, you know, and even ask, you don't even have to know all the terms of the mortgage. <laughs> you can just put subject to the existing mortgage, right? And then yeah. when you get those terms, you know, those terms apply. So, um, yeah. you know, that's what you want to do on that. As far as paperwork, every title company won't do it. Every attorney won't do it, right? So, you know, like my main title company doesn't do subject to. I had to find another one, you know? So you do want to find a good lawyer or a title company that will that will do those transactions and, uh, you know, ask them to write up good documents for you. You might want to have your own attorney that, that does it draft up special documents for yourself, you know, that's going to be, you know, kind of you out there testing the water, seeing what's best for you in that. Yeah. Ben brings up a good point. Like disclosure is the name of the game with creative finance, right? You know, you need to make sure there has to be a lot of trust involved in the beginning anyways for a creative finance deal to work because a good deal for any creative finance structured deal, it has to be a good deal for you. It has to be a good deal for the owner. Otherwise it doesn't work. If it's a bad deal for you, it's a bad deal for the owner. Um, but like Ben says, he uses a standard contract, but he adds addendums to describe creative terms. But I've literally, uh, I wish I had it over here. I have to find it. But like our last contract, we, uh, we added all these extra things at the last minute. So we literally wrote it out on a legal notepad and had the, had it signed and dated. Uh, and that yeah, was no, our addendum. Addendums. I use addendums all the time, right? Cause this, there yeah. might be stuff that, for example, we're buying a house from a lady right now who has a lot of, out of the ordinary uh, requests in term in regards to like stuff in the property, right? Like she, she wants certain stuff to be taken. She wants certain stuff to only be taken to this one storage facility. Some stuff she wants it to be like given to a, there's a lot of stuff, right? So that can't fit into your standard contract. So whatever's out right. of the norm, you just create an addendum for it. You just put on the addendum, you send the addendum with the contract. And, and you can literally do it on a blank job. sheet of paper and write it in yeah, plain it English. Be, it can be, yeah, make a word doc and just addendum to, pur to purchase agreement. It's just write everything on there. Yeah. Just make sure you get signatures and dates. That's it. Um, how can I find an RMLO in, in any market when doing owner financing? I use call the underwriter, um, Michelle yeah. and Max. I call the underwriter. They do them for me. There might be states that they're licensed in, but any state that I'm, that I'm, that I'm doing it in, they can handle right now. So that's why I use their, you know, their full license. They can do full RMLO. Uh, limited RMLO, but they do all of mine. I think that's all we got for questions, guys. Keep them coming. Uh, Definitely. I got in a little late last night, so that's why I'm kind of dragging. I got in about midnight, which is late for me. <laughs> Wait, late for you? That's late. <laughs> midnight is late beyond late for me. <laughs> Uh, eight o'clock is late for me. I'm thinking like midnight. Well, we went up to Hattiesburg, morning. checked on, I checked on my flip, CC fired an assistant and interviewed and then hired an assistant. And then she had some, she had some stuff to do at the office and then we left at five and everybody was asking us if we wanted to go, uh, grab some dinner. And I was like, all right, well, we go grab some dinner. Next thing you know, we're leaving at like nine o'clock at night with a three hour drive. So we got home about midnight last night and I think I passed out around 2 a.m. So Yeah, that's a ooh, that's an all nighter. What's your buy box to bring you deals? That is a great question, but and maybe you can answer it's a very hard hard question for me to answer. It it really <laughs> is. I, you know, yeah. people say, oh, you know, bring me bring me anything that's a deal, right? But when I say that, I mean it because we have bought deals. We have bought, I've done numerous videos that we have bought deals from wholesalers that the wholesaler could not wholesale, right? That it was not a deal. But because of our strategy of owner financing, we were able to make it fit our box, you know? So it's really tough for me to go out there and say, you know, uh, <laughs> I want this, 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 right? My number one thing is I'm a cash flow investor. I'm not looking for fix and flips. I'm looking for some of that cash flows, right? But 
I can create cash flow from an as is property. It can be a fire damage property that sell as is that I create cash flow from. So, you know, that's why it's like anything that, you know, is distressed. I don't want retail deals. I'll say that. I don't want the house that's, you know, Zillow says 180 and they're saying I'll give you for 160. That doesn't what I'm doing. I'm not, I'm not trying to do that. You know, I want, because my end buyers, I'm also trying to create value for them on the back end too, you know? So oh, I'm looking for, for yeah, if they're open for terms and are really, really good terms, you know, if, and then it might make sense. It might, but most of those homes, they're not, <laughs> they're not trying to give you the terms that, that makes I mean, sense. I got the very first owner finance deal I was a part of. Uh, that wasn't a sub two, but it was a, a traditional owner finance deal. The guy who bought a house, probably worth one hundred fifty, one hundred sixty thousand dollars. Didn't really need much. He had, he had bought it as a to use it as a rental to produce income. He had it on a rental program with the local Camp Shelby uh, Army base or National Guard mm-hmm. base, and they dropped. They stopped doing it out in his area, so he had to go and become a landlord again. When they basically placed the tenant, handled all the maintenance, all that stuff, and he got a check. So it was nice. That program ended and he got some tenants that weren't so friendly and ended up like ditching him for five or six months worth of rent. Uh, and he finally got them out of there and he was ready to sell it and he just wanted to sell it and be done. I was like, well, he owned it for like 10 years. So like, so we, we kind of educated him on, um, you know, you have to pay that depreciation, uh, recapture back on from your taxes and you're going to have to pay some capital gains on it. Um, you know, or you could go use a property management company and keep it and you could have that income. But what if we, you know, what if we gave you the price that you were wanting? I think he was wanting 140. Um, and we were able to structure something that would actually continue to make you a return. That's better than you're going to go get at the bank. So we ended up structuring up like a 3% at 140,000 dollars, no money down. Um, and we closed on it. So we had like 1500 to 2000 dollars out of pocket. And I don't think we had a payment due until we got a renter in there. Yeah. So I think we had like a whole like 30 to 45 days. So 150, $160,000 house. We paid 140 for it. I think our payment and all that stuff was around 800 bucks or some change. Maybe back then I can't, I have to go put my 10 BI and see what that number comes out to. But uh, either way, we ended up renting it for 1300 a month. So we were good. He was happy. He was getting an income. Um, off his asset and he didn't have to pay all these capital gains taxes. Yeah, I guess, you know, to make it easy for Ivan, what I would say is, you know, my company focuses on, you know, affordable housing, entry level housing, right? I mean, that's, I'm not the guy who wants to see the, you know, $1.5 million house. If it's a crazy, amazing, amazing deal, I don't want to turn it down, right? But what do we focus on and what is our niche and what are we trying to like, you know, see, especially in the market changing right now, right? So for example, right now the market's changing. You know what market is not cooling down right now affordable housing right entry level housing right the the midterm the the higher level stuff they're starting to slow down a lot right that entry level housing is on fire because people who are looking to get into a house for the first time on that you know depending on what your market is you know that entry level floor that market is, on, is insane right now you know so that's the market I, that i focus on so whatever market you're in you know i would say that's where i'm looking to buy houses in. If you're if your median average house is 150, then we're looking to be in that 150 below range. You know, we're looking to provide housing, you know, with owner financing to that market right there. You know, if it's 350, then we're looking to be around the 350 range. Um, you know, I'll that's buy, a good answer. I'll, I'll right. give you I'll give you a buy box if you're looking to to hit my county, um, Baldwin County here in Alabama. 75 75 cents on the dollar. So what ARV times 0.75 minus whatever repairs. I'll buy that all day long down here in Baldwin County, pretty much anywhere in the county. Uh, preferably 1960s or newer, and preferably three beds or, or more. But I also, I mean, you got a mobile home park down here you come across? Like, I'll buy it. RV park, I'll buy it if, it's, if I can make it make sense. Um, multifamily, same thing. But my our primary focus is picking up. Um, short-term rentals down here on the beach and then picking up some good long-term rentals about 30 miles inland um, in that 0.75 range of ARV. He asked, he asked the second part of the question, Ivan did. What properties are you not interested uh, in? Either? What deals are you not interested in? Large, multi, mobile home? I mean, I, I really listen, look, I really I, look I at everything. A, yeah, I bought a mobile home park last year. I'm looking to buy one a year if I can, right? So, so mobile home parks, again, 
that's affordable housing, right? More mobile home parks are affordable housing, right? Yeah. Uh, large multi units, you know, that can become, you know, we're looking at that too. So, land, if it's in Puerto Rico, sell me some land. <laughs> you know, if it's, if it's, you know, I'm looking at land I am for farming purposes. So, if it's in Puerto Rico, if it's in certain states in the, in the U.S., I will look at land. But, um, you know, mobile home parks, we are definitely looking to get to get more. About the only thing I'm not terribly interested in is like small, like say a lot, like a half acre or smaller, unless it's unless it's buildable and close to water. Um, yeah. Other than that, I'm, there's not really much I want to. Large commercial deals. I mean, there's literally a building that's been sitting sitting empty since 2008, been tied up in lawsuits. It was going to be like one of the biggest tourist attractions down here. They're going to have like dolphin shows and all kinds of stuff. And it literally just shut down in 08, been tied up in lawsuits ever since. And they're, I think they're trying to get like 25 million for it, but it's going to cost probably 10 million to tear all that shit down and, and remove it. Like, I'm not really interested in that. No, I mean, I'm like not, a, you know, that's not what I do, right? I mean, you want to say, oh, yeah, send me those luxuries. That's not what I do. And, and I've learned stick to what i do right so you know i'm, I'm trying to be especially hyper focused now with the market turning on what we do you know i'm not trying to start reaching out all over here and do this kind of stuff i mean you know even airbnb you know like we've been talking about airbnb and stuff but i mean i don't know if you saw what Atlanta just did i mean there's a lot of airbnb laws are changing airbnb is not a solid solid model all the time right so you know even airbnb it's got to be it's got to make sense for me where if i have to rent it as a regular rental it makes sense you know I mean, a lot, people, gas a hit. lot of people have been underwriting Airbnb uh, deals only for Airbnb income and hotel. The hotel lobbyists are very, very powerful. If you cannot see already, they are changing the laws. So, um, you know, you might want to make suggest, sure that those I would suggest picking areas where it's high tourism, where, you know, Airbnb is like if it's, you know, if it's a major metro area like, you know, Dallas or Atlanta and stuff like that, they will start cracking down because there's there is a lot of hotels there. Whereas like. The beaches all along Florida and Alabama and up the eastern coast and west coast and all that stuff. Like people, I mean, know, San Diego, major metro area, right? So if you got yeah, yeah. major metro areas, they're going to they're going to crack down on Airbnb. Uh, I'm not saying they will, but there's a, there's a high likelihood that they could. Whereas here, there's not a lot of hotel options. Everyone really thrives off of being able to rent their their vacation home. So know where you're investing. So like Pigeon Forge, Gatlinburg, those areas, those are probably going to be pretty safe for a very long time. Um, you know, the Alabama and Florida beaches, those are probably going to be safe for a very long yeah, time. I mean, like Puerto Rico, right? I'm looking. At, I don't see Puerto Rico yeah. cracking on the Airbnbs, you know. But yeah, yeah, I don't see Orlando cracking on Airbnbs, you know. But Atlanta is, San Diego is. I mean, these other spots where it's large metro and it's not so much only tourism, you're going to probably start seeing a hit. So just be careful out there. Uh, let's see. Any more questions? Make sure I didn't miss anything. You have one up before I we went back to that. William Bailey. Uh, before I even had a question. Oh no! I I, I said I answered that one, didn't I? Oh no! Right no, here. No, boom. What, yeah. When wholesaling a sub two deal, should I introduce the seller and the new buyer taking over the payments? That's a great question. I do. I always do. Yeah, I would 100%. How, and this is, I don't, I'm not one of the big proponents of wholesaling. I get your money where you can get it. Wholesaling is subject to deal. That's all fine and dandy. But just know that if there's ever, ever, ever an issue, your name could always be brought back into that situation. If there's ever any kind of court rulings or lawsuits or anything like that, you could be on the line for uh, setting that deal up. You're not doing anything yeah. wrong. However, you're, you're, you're taking a contract that you got under contract that you're saying you're going to do and you're assigning it to someone else. So you want to make sure that person you're assigning to is one that's competent and capable of making sure that they can make the payments and they're a good buyer. That's what uh, I would say. Don't wholesale to some random buyer you don't know, right? Yeah. Whenever I've wholesaled a sub to, I have a history and I know the buyer. <laughs> you know, yeah. I can call yeah. that buyer on the phone. If, you know, because let me know, right, I'm going to let you know right now, even though you introduced the buyer and the seller, that seller's gonna still call you first, right? Because you're yeah. the one he dealt yeah. with, right? So yep. I always make sure you're that the one that built the trust, it. you're the one that built the rapport, you're the one that did the contract. I mean, they're looking at you. 
Yeah. So make sure you have a you know ethical reputable buyer that's not going to get you in trouble or you know mess with your name. It's all about your name. You know you might not get in legal trouble, but your name's going to get messed up. And in right. real estate, your name is your name means so much. You know if, if I can tell you about anything, your name and your word. You know, and when you know, hey, George is a good person. He does this. He does that. Right. That's that means so much in the real estate. You might make a lot of money for a short time, even doing unethical things, but your name's going to start being spread around very quickly. That hey. You might want to watch out doing business with him, you know? <clears throat> right. Um, Airbnb in Texas, what do you guys think? I know a lot of people who are crushing it in Texas. Just remember, try not to buy on, it needs to be a good deal. Try not to buy on, on retail terms, hoping that you can get what AirDNA tells you you can make. Because, um, I mean, realistically, that means if I were to put my short-term rental as a 10 cap, it's supposed to, it should gross about $70,000 a year. If I put it on a 10 cap on that, on those gross numbers, it means my place is worth like $700,000. Um, and it's not, it's only worth about 500 tops completely fixed up. So, and I got it at 360. So at worst case scenario, I could sell it today for 435 to 450. Yeah. But yes, Airbnbs will work in Texas. Just don't put all your eggs in that basket and don't bet that they don't bet your numbers on Airbnb being always, always the only way to make money on it. Cause if that's the case, you can find yourself in a sticky situation. That's not good. Not to mention, you know, cities can change Airbnb laws. I mean, even in Atlanta, if you got one, like you're fine, like cities can change Airbnb laws. The County can change it. There can be a, a environmental disaster. Like we had the oil spills down here. Um, I'm paying almost $9,000 in insurance just so we can have, if there's a loss of use that I'm getting paid, what I would normally make as a rental. Right. So we have a $70,000, uh, insurance or saying that we're going to grow $70,000. If I completely lose the house, I make $70,000. I don't, I don't lose my month, my income. Yeah, I don't. I don't know all the laws. I mean, I saw the Atlanta law, the San Diego law. I mean, I do know that a lot of people are buying multiple Airbnbs in those <laughs> in those cities. Not only buying them, they're leasing them and then doing the Airbnb arbitrage with the leases, right? So, I just know that that is going to affect a lot, a lot of people. I think so. We'll see. Um, I've always been. The, I've always said in any investment, have multiple exit strategies, right? Any deal that I buy, just because I'm comfortable here, I say, hey, okay. Um, can I sell on the financing? If not, can I rent it out in cash flow? Right. If not, can I fire sell enough to get my money back? You know, like that's how I look at everything. Right. So I know that yeah. if, if the market changes quickly, which, you know, it can overnight, you know, can I still get rid of this, this, uh, this house and pay my private money back? You know, so any deal you do, you want to evaluate it, you know, in those terms. Ben brings up a good point. Make sure seller has recourse example, set up set it up as a mirror wrap or make sure you have an attorney who will do something like a deed to secure performance for the seller. Yeah, we do performance deeds. Performance deeds is just, it just states that, you know, if, if the loan goes to fault, let's say, you know, past 30 days, they can execute that performance deed to get the property back without having to go through a foreclosure and a long run drawn out process. Yeah. If you, uh, Ivan brings up, like if you can, if you can comp it and make money as a long-term rental, Absolutely, it's a good deal. That's, so if yeah, you that, cash that flow and long term rental, and then you Airbnb it, it is not going to affect you if Airbnb doesn't it gets canceled in your town. And that should be on, again fix and flips too, right? I mean, at the end of the day, real estate is a safe investment because you can rent it out and get income from it, right? So it becomes speculative when you're buying at prices where you know you can't cash flow or at least break even if the market turns. If you're always buying real estate and you say, hey. Worst case scenario, I can rent this out long term and still break even or cash flow. You're buying it at the right price, you know, because rental rates aren't going down. <laughs> I mean, that, that much we can promise you, right? So, you know, comp it at today's rental rates too. Don't comp it at like projected rates down the future. Comp it at today's rental rates. Right. So that, that kind of answers what William was asking. So for an Airbnb, you could look at a deal as a flip. Then if Airbnb goes wrong, I could still sell it and make property and make a profit. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would look at it as more of like if I buy it and I'm keeping it, my plan is to keep it. Can I, at the very least, uh, can I long term rent it? Can I rent it out for the year and it's still cash flow? Or is there enough equity there that I can fire sell it? Right. I'm looking at all those options. Either one is fine. And it's whatever you're yeah. comfortable with. So, 
Cool. Any other questions, guys, before we jump off for the day? We got the uh, Billfish Classic launching today, so I'm pretty excited about that. Oh, the what? captain's getting the the ca Billfish Classic. Where they go uh, go out and uh, compete in a fishing tournament for big game fish. I'm going to be in it next year, so don't worry. <laughs> you going to be fishing? Oh, yeah. Nice. I'm going to do some tournaments next in the next year for sure. They pay out like a million dollars. You might not even hear from me. Nah, that's not enough. You'll be back. No, it's, it's not enough. <laughs> what million it's not a, you might not hear from me for a couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah, that might be the case. Yeah, but maybe we'll like uh, a month or two. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, that's going to be it for us today. And uh, we will see you guys back here, same time, same place next week for real estate investing advice. Appreciate the feedback today, guys. Now. I appreciate everybody jumping on, bringing your questions. I had a lot of great questions today. We will see you guys next week. This episode of the Wholesale Hackers Live Q&A is brought to you by DealBell.io. Get the unfair advantage you never knew existed. DealBell gives you all the tools you need, including their innovative skip stack technology so you can effortlessly identify the hottest off-market properties and win more deals faster. For more information and a free 14-day trial, go to www.dealbell.io. DealBell, win the deal and ring the bell.